I don't care where you drive. They're either resurfacing, uh, resurfacing, putting in guardrails, or somebody's having a parade somewhere. It just is impossible to get around. So with a little bit of levity, and I happened to rediscover this in, from looking over some of my notes on Mark Twain, not that we're talking about Mark Twain, but Mark Twain really had an excellent sense of humor. And I forgot this wonderful line. You ready for this? Familiarity breeds contempt and children. <laughs> it's terrific, isn't it? And, and, that's, and that's Mark Twain capturing the moment, just like you know, Benjamin Franklin was always able to, to capture the moment. So today what I'd like to do is I'd like to, I'd like to finish. We have a little bit of, of housekeeping still to do with John Marshall and get him retired. And then to, as I was thinking about it last night, that rather than leaping immediately to the turn of the century, we need to talk about one of the most outrageous decisions in the history of the court, and that's an editorial opinion. And that, and that of course, is the uh, Dred Scott decision of 1857, and where that came from. And that was rooted in the, well, that was rooted in the Fifth Amendment, but there was something else going on as well. What a surprise, the court gets political. And we've mentioned that, haven't we? That Marshall always viewed the Constitution as both a legal document and a political document. And depending on what court you're talking about, it could also be a partisan document. But I'm not going to touch that, because that's really a, an editorial point of view. So that being said, let's, let's just revisit Marshall. Last week, two weeks last week, we talked about Marshall and McCullough versus Maryland and the Supremacy Clause and that federal law trumps state law. And we also talked about in, in Marbury versus Madison that the court would be the arbitrator, the arbiter rather, of the language of the Constitution. What did it mean at that point in time? And a third case in 1810, and this is Fletcher versus Peck. <coughs> And in Fletcher versus Peck, and I'll just do a little background with it, and we'll move along. In Fletcher versus Peck, Marshall also gave the court the power to determine the, the validity of state law, you know, with regard to the Constitution as well. And this is a, a very, this is a tawdry case. It involves corruption. It involves racketeering, if you will. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It involves insider trading, and it took place right at the turn of the century in Georgia. And the first half of the, maybe the first, well, let's say, the first half of the 19th century, you know, was about both, both there was not the population heading west. The frontier was heading west, and people were heading west. And they were heading into the south as well. And there was, in Georgia, uh, there was a group of land speculators, and nothing wrong with buying low and selling high. Uh, that's the way the, the stock market operates. But this was particularly sloppy, that there were a group of land speculators in Georgia, and it was called the Yazoo Company. There were four companies, rather loosely affiliated, and they control, they gain access by bribing the Georgia legislature. They gained access to about 35 million square miles. And this is Georgia, west of the Yazoo River, all of Alabama, all of Mississippi. Nobody accused these people of thinking small. So this was an enormous amount of land speculation where they bought up all this land and bribing every member of the Georgia legislature to give, this, to give them this enormous land grant. And the number simply is, well, to look at the, the turnaround, Nothing wrong with making a profit. They bought the land, the Yasu land speculators, they bought the land for, ten, for two cents an acre, and they sold it for a dime. So even by, what does land, what does an acre go for? And I'll bet it's more than 10 cents. I'll bet you it's up almost to a buck. Right? I'm willing to bet that. And, the, and so Fletcher versus Peck in 1810, that Mr. Fletcher, had bought some land for Mr. Peck, who was part of this land speculating scheme, you see. Well, 
The deal stank so much, even in the nose of Georgians, that in the next election, they threw the entire legislature out of office. And they, they voted in a new legislature, Georgia, the Georgia voters did, which completely nullified the contract. See, this is about contracts, mm -hmm. which completely nullified the contract that between Georgia, the state of Georgia, the assembly of Georgia, and the Yazoo Land Company. And, the, and after years of bouncing around in the courts, it finally made it to the Supreme Court. And if we look at, just a moment, if we look at Article 10, Section 1 of the, of the Constitution, and I know you don't have a copy with you, but I do. So you can trust me on you have one as well. All right, show and tell. All right, this is good, this is good, this is good. Now, do you share? Do you, do you share? Good. I know our report cards would read shares and does not run with scissors. <laughs> Miss McDermott was always concerned about the children running with scissors. When you're seven years old, maybe eight, and I can take a side trip for a minute, I never figured out why Miss McDermott, it was always puzzling, would have speak about herself in the third person. She would say, would you please bring Miss McDermott the scissors? <laughs> but you were Miss McDermott. So I, I found that rather puzzling, and now I know it's a deep psychological problem. <laughs> the towel was on the couch, when you're always referring to yourself in the third person. It's an identity issue. Section, uh, Article 1 of the Constitution, Section 10. And it deals with, 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 what, with the prohibitions against states. And I'll just read a couple of lines here. I think this, this whole section is interesting. It's short. No state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation, comma, grant letters of mark or reprisal, that's being a legal pirate, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debt. That's changed. <laughs> Pass any bill of attainder, ex post facto law, or law impairing the obligation of contracts, or law impairing the obligation of contracts. John Marshall zeroed in on this. The framers zeroed in on this. The sanctity of private property that once a contract is made, now we know times have changed, it's been almost three centuries, but for Marshall, once a contract was made between two, as he said, and this is the word he used, innocent parties, Fletcher v. Peck, neither one was innocent. <laughs> they knew the entire thing was tainted, full of corruption, and smelled from the beginning, but Marshall wanted to protect the sanctity of private contract between individuals, and that no state can, and the word he used, annul a contract. A contract is a contract, and it is sacred, and it violates the whole notion of private property protections under the Fifth Amendment as well. Marshall knew the case smelled to high heaven. Marshall looked the other way. Marshall was a Virginian. That's not an editorial comment. Marshall, Marshall was looking to establish the fact that the Supreme Court needs to protect the sanctity of property, the sanctity of a contract, and that a state cannot simply go in, a group of reformers go in and annul and change the language of a contract. A contract is a contract. That's just what he was looking for and looking to protect here. And I know that if you, if you read the Constitution, or maybe not even read it, but perhaps read scholars who talk about the Constitution, they always make the point of mentioning that the Constitution is also a, a grant, it's also a, a, an endeavor to protect private property, investment, and the economic growth of the country. And that's the Beer thesis, that most of these men were property holders, bankers, and so forth, and they were positive that they needed to protect property from the control, the arbitrary seizure by the state and or, and or violations of contracts, rewriting contracts. That's 
Marshall. Now, the one guy that he tangled with that he did not challenge because President Andrew Jackson was not about to abide by the law. And this was a court case in 1830, 1835, right before Marshall retired. And it's Worcester, Worcester versus Georgia. There's Georgia again. And, and this deals with the fact, we, we've all read about this, and this is the Trail of Tears. You know, when the, um, you know, the, the Cherokee and the Creek and the Choctaw and so forth were forced off their lands in, in Alabama and in parts of Georgia. Why? Well, because Andrew Jackson, in getting reelected, had made a promise to the voters of Georgia that if you support me, that I will evict these tribes that have been there since time out of mind. Worcester represented the Cherokee Nation. And the, the Supreme Court found in favor of the Cherokee Nation, that as a nation, that the state of Georgia could not simply evict them. Jackson said, I have a campaign promise, and I'm going to deliver on it. If I don't, my successor will. And his successor will deliver on that. And even though the court ruled that Georgia may not trespass on the lands of the, of the Cherokee, that they're an established nation with a, with a legislature, a constitution, an alphabet, a printing press, a newspaper, and all of that. A, a political promise is a political promise, and you are being evicted. And as Jackson said, he may not have said this, but it's part of the canon, let John Marshall enforce it. The court has no army. We've talked about that. The only thing that gives it the force of law is that we accept it. You know, that someone has to make the final call. Marshall let it go. Why? Because if I try to insist on enforcing this, he knew Jackson, and Jackson snubs his nose at the court, it will diminish the authority of the court. Recall, we've always talked about the fact that we have, that Marshall wanted to, to certainly establish the court as a co-equal branch of the government. And if, if the President of the United States refuses to enforce this, and I cannot force him to do so, it minimizes the authority of the court. And that begs the question, way up the road, for the next time we meet in September, or, or in October, that begs the question, if Dwight Eisenhower had refused to, had refused to enforce Brown v. Board, you know, what could the courts have done about it? And the answer is nothing. It would have been the press, it would have been public opinion, it would have been public exposure. And Eisenhower enforced that ruling, didn't he? Even though he thought it was a foolish ruling and that one cannot legislate morality, one simply waits for the, the times and public opinion to catch up with the situation. Well, that's not always true. And we know that the, in this case, I mean, the court led the way. But that's a different story when we talk about Earl Warren, another great Chief Justice. So in 1935, a tired and aging and sick John Marshall, you know, will, 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 retires, he dies. He retires and dies, dies and retires. And Roger B. Taney is the next Supreme Court Chief Justice. And he, too, will have a tenure of almost 30 years. And we remember Taney, Roger B. Taney, for the notorious Dred Scott case, the decision made in 1857 a highly political decision. And I'll tip my mitt right here, that what, what Tawney was looking to do with the Dred Scott decision was, trying to re, was to remove the issue of slavery from national debate. Because he saw, he believed, that the Union was heading for a crack up. That slavery might lead, might lead to disillusion, secession, and the crack up of the nation and that I could do a good service through the courts to eliminate the question of slavery from national debate. That was his goal. He failed miserably, obviously, and also is remembered. If we remember Tawney for anything, it's for Dred, the Dred Scott, Dred Scott case, Dred Scott versus Sanford. Now, where did this come from? It need not even have reached the Supreme Court. Tawney pulled it in. 
he was looking for this type of case to see if he could neutralize the threat of the threat of a of slavery to this to the to the to the cohesion of the union. Dred Scott and and his family, Dred Scott and his wife and his children, have been slaves in Missouri, and their master, all right, their owner, had had taken them, Dred Scott and his family, north. He was an army surgeon, and had taken them north into into Wisconsin, into free territory. And then he had returned, his name was Emerson, and he had returned to Missouri, and he, and he died. And his wife, Helen, I believe, remarried, and she remarried a man by the name of Sanford. Now, that marriage, there was, a, there was a, something off, well, she brought to the marriage slaves. Now, that was a bit awkward since Sanford was a New York abolitionist. <laughs> so this is a little bit awkward. This is, this is bad baggage. And however, however, Sanford saw it as an opportunity that what we'll do is, and we'll set this up, and Montgomery Blair, who later on will serve in the Lincoln Cabinet as Postmaster General, will represent you know, the interest of Dred Scott. Dred Scott had no money. Dred Scott was a, a pleasant looking man, and, but Dred Scott was provided an attorney by Sanford and Montgomery Blair, and we are going to sue in the Missouri, you are going to sue me, I'm allowing you to sue me in the Missouri, in the Missouri court system, and it goes to the Missouri Supreme Court, sue me for your freedom and your wife's freedom and your children's freedom on this basis that your former master had taken you into free territory, and that once you were in free territory, that made you a free man. In other words, the, the, we, can, we can abbreviate this to simply say, free air makes a free man. So that's the basis of his lawsuit. So it makes its way through the Missouri court, it goes to the Missouri State Supreme Court, and they say, absolutely not, deny. Free air does not make a free man that your status is that of chattel property. Property, chattel, cattle, it's an old biblical term. You are property, Fifth Amendment. And, 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 and simply claiming time served in a, in, a, in a free territory does not allow you to, if you will, free yourself. It's not going to happen. So it's appealed, and it goes to the Supreme Court. All Tawney had to do was simply say, we agree, there's no case here, we agree with the Missouri State Supreme Court, that ruling stands. But that is not what Tawney did. He wanted to hear the case. And as we said the first afternoon we met, that if enough judges can be marshaled together who want to hear a case, there were nine on the court at this time, most of them were slaveholders. Tawney had been a slaveholder from Maryland. He had freed his slaves. He was 79 or 80 years of age. He, judgment day was coming. I think he wanted to make it right with his God. But he wanted also to be able to take slavery out of the national debate. He did not have to hear it. He simply could have said the Missouri ruling stands. But he brought it on. I want, I want to bring it on, I want to hear it. And he did, and the ruling came down seven to two. Seven to two, that, that free air does not make a free man. Didn't even have to say that. But he said two other things that were important. He said that the Constitution, number one, number one, since you're here, well he wouldn't have been there, he being Dred Scott, that you have, you have no you have no right in this court. You are a slave. You are property. You are chattel property to be bought and sold, traded, deeded, used as, a collateral, as collateral and a loan, whatever you want, however you want to phrase that. You are property. You are a sack of corn, a wagon, a, a herd of cattle. That you, with no disrespect, you are property. You have no right being bringing suit in this court. The Constitution was not written with you in mind. 
So the laws of the Constitution do not apply to you. You are not a federal citizen. Maybe you're a citizen of the state of Missouri, but that's the, that's the call of the state of Missouri. But you are not, you were not perceived as a citizen when the Constitution was adopted. You, you have no standing in this court. And secondly, and here's, and here's, here's the bigger bombshell, is that Congress may not prohibit slavery from moving into the territories. Mm -hmm. Now, where did this come from? <clears throat> Again, the court is political. And as early as 1820, and I'm not going to get into all of this unless there's a question later on, as early as 1820, the Missouri Compromise, and you might remember that from school days, it's a crossword puzzle item. <laughs> the Missouri Compromise, and had drawn a line of latitude across the Louisiana Territory. And this had been done with the, and this had been done to divide the Louisiana Territory. Every, everything north of 3630 is closed to slavery. Everything <coughs> south is open. And what precipitated that ruling is that Missouri, the territory of Missouri, had now filled up with a, with a sufficient number of citizens to apply for statehood. And it applied as a slave state. So the question of whether or not slavery may go into the territories surfaced here in a, in a major way in 1819, 1820. And the Congress, hold that thought, the Congress divided, actually it was one third, two thirds, the Louisiana Territory. Again, everything north of 3630 is closed to slavery, everything south is open. So Missouri is in. And in order to balance Missouri as a slave state with an with a, with a equal number of free states, that Massachusetts was cracked off, um, not Massachusetts, Maine was cracked off from Massachusetts and, and entered as a free state to balance the entrance of Missouri as a slave state. So where are we in 1820? We have 11 slave states, and 11 free states. That was the question. But Congress had determined whether or not slavery may go into that territory. The same, the same decision, or not the same decision, but the same principle was applied in 1850. In 1850, the question, what about the new lands acquired from Mexico? Acquired. <laughs> They're not trespassing. <laughs> we are. We took that land from them. And, we, and, and, and one of the ways I always address the Mexican-American War is, and you know that I'm not a bleeding heart liberal from Cambridge, that one of the ways that I address the, the Mexican-American War is I refer to it as Mr. Polk's War. And, and truth to tell, Mr. Polk, President Polk, sucker punched the Mexicans. He truly did. He set them up. And he, he hit them with a haymaker, and and at the end of that, you know, we grabbed we grabbed all the, the Mexican session, you know, Texas and everything north, which included California, which was the big prize, you see, for for Polk. Polk was a southerner. Polk was from Tennessee. Polk was a slaveholder, and all of this land ought to be open to slavery. Well, it was not, and Congress was able to craft another compromise, and this is talk about lack of imagination. The Compromise of 1820, the fact that it has a number shows lack of imagination, and so does this one, the Compromise of 1850. Both of these compromises were crafted by Henry Clay of Kentucky. And the Compromise of 1850 simply said that, simply said that the California Congress is in it's a free state, and that the territories, and these are large territories now, Territories of Nebraska, uh, not Nebraska, territories of New Mexico, and the territories of Utah will be open to slavery if the folks who live there so say so. So Congress is making the determination as to what parts of the Mexican session slavery may go into, just as they did 30 years earlier in 18, 1820 with the Missouri Compromise. Now, this raised most, the, the Compromise of 1850 did what it was supposed to do. That is to say, it finally, it finally delineated where slavery may go 
and may not go. We know in the Northwest it's closed. We know in after the American Revolution, Massachusetts, New York, Rhode Island abolished slavery. We know where it can go in the Louisiana Territory. We now where it, we, where it can go in the lands acquired from Mexico. Well, Ralph Waldo Emerson had it right. And Emerson is so quotable. He grew up not too far from here, <laughs> right down the road, and over there. And, and Emerson making the observation that the lands from Mexico will poison us. And by that he meant the issue of slavery, because these Southerners, these Southern slaveholders, are not going to sit tight realizing that so much of the public domain has been eliminated by Congress. And they are going to want to overturn the Missouri Compromise, if they can, and the Compromise of 1850. So here comes Roger B. Taney pulling this in that as a former slaveholder, slaves are property, that you have no right to sue in a, in a federal court. When the Constitution was written, you were not citizens. And thirdly, and here's the, here's the bombshell, that the Congress, nor the people living in a territory, may outlaw slavery. Slavery is national, it's no longer sectional. It, may, it is property, I am defending the property rights of southern slaveholders, chattel property. Now this led to the question, uh, well does that mean that slavery can be reintroduced in New York or into Massachusetts? Well, no one answered that question. You know that when the Supreme Court makes a ruling, it raises as many questions as perhaps it solves. So that became a, a moot question in the Civil War. Frankly, the Civil War will overturn Dred Scott. So we're talking 1857, 1861. Lincoln, who is not really on the, on the radar yet outside of Illinois, Lincoln captured it wonderfully. And that Lincoln's comment was that the Dred Scott decision has all the moral authority of a decision made in a bar room. All right, so there's Lincoln on that issue. Lincoln was not an abolitionist by any means. Lincoln early on was a, an individual who favored recolonization of black Americans, either to the West Indies or, or back to West Africa, or maybe out beyond the Mississippi River. But he knew the issue of slavery was the third rail. He would never have used that analogy, was explosive. And that Tawney hoped that by his ruling that it would become a moot issue as to where slavery could go and not go and take it off the table in, in terms of being a national debate. All it did was to energize all of this. Something else happened which is unprecedented and it's only happened this one time in my memory and I, and I can't think of any other, I know I'm right on this one. The decision was seven to two. Seven Southerners supported their Chief Justice. Two Northerners did not, uh, one of whom was Justice Chappie of Massachusetts. Both of these men resigned from the court because they could no longer sit with a court that accepted slavery as being legal and that individuals were indeed chattel property. Now imagine today the type of statement that could be made if one resigned from the court that I cannot abide sitting with this court after this decision. It would not happen. It's not going to happen. But it was so explosive, two guys resigned rather than to sit with that court and agree with, not agree, but to sit with a court that made such an egregious decision. Now that's, that's taking the bull by the horn, excuse the cliche. I, I've never seen it since, I wasn't alive, I've never seen it since, and I don't think you're going to see it anytime soon. Where, but wouldn't it be great if Ruth Bader Ginsburg got up and just <laughs> tore off her robes and said, well, her robes, anyway, <laughs> tore off her robes, and, 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 and said, I'm done, I'm done, I can't live with this decision, and I'm quitting here. Uh, did uh, Buchanan uh, appoint uh, replacements? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Now, Buchanan knew that decision was coming. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I, I was just wondering, what was the uh, uh, political status of the, of the uh, new appointees? Were they, they were safe 
Democrats. Buchanan was called a doughboy, or a doughface, rather. He was a northerner with southern principles. Mm -hmm. And speaking of Buchanan, Buchanan was the only man, this will win you some money on a quiz show. <laughs> <laughs> He's the only president to have been a bachelor. Oh. And the place looked like it. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Mrs. Lincoln when she showed up to a case the White House. As she told her sisters, it looks like bats and ghosts live here. <laughs> and, he said, and she was terribly appalled by the fact, this is a great story, when they walked into the Oval Office, all the ladies backed off quickly, Mary and her sisters. Sister Mary, what is this? And there was, there was simply canvas oilcloth all over the floor of the, of the Oval Office with br large brown splotches. <laughs> because when you're a guy, and you don't have to worry about a Mrs. Buchanan to clean up, you know, that for the uh, Friday night card game or Monday night football, these guys are chewing. And if you hit the, if you hit the spittoon, fine. And if you don't, who cares? <laughs> so that's what she was looking for. And then in the family quarters, bats and those Buchanan appointed two safe Democrats. The the court lost so much moral authority. Were they pro or anti-slavery? Oh, they were pro-slavery. They were Southern Democrats. The, the Democratic Party was run by the South. Uh, the old Democratic Party, not the party of Franklin Roosevelt. You know, the, uh, the the party of the 19th century, the Democratic Party of the 19th century, was the the party of slavery, states' rights, and limited government. These are the men that Buchanan would have a, did appoint. And Buchanan, as he told Lincoln when they were writing to the inaugural, sir, if, you're, if you are as happy upon being sworn in as I am in leaving, you <laughs> indeed are a happy man. The nation was coming apart, and he knew it. The uh, South Carolina had already seceded you know, after Lincoln's election, and, and six more states had joined South Carolina, and Buchanan leaving in March, simply wanted out. I am not going to hand off to Lincoln a war. And recall with me, recall with me that the inaugurals were in March, not January. So by March of 1861, seven states are out of the Union. Buchanan is still in office. And Buchanan wants nothing to do with starting a war and handing it off to Lincoln. Let Lincoln deal with it, and I'm just glad to go home. And at the time, he was the oldest president to have resigned from, from the presidency. So here we have this Dred Scott decision, rather than calming matters, simply inflaming them. And of course, as Lincoln said, rather laconically, you know, and the war came. But that's, by the way, Dred Scott was free. That, I mean, this was all a set, not a setup. This was all to test the law to see if the court would, would, would speak to the issue of slavery in real ways, genuine ways, and obviously it did not. By the way, by the way, when, uh, when those, that decision, that decision was recast and rewritten, and there was many a priest, and more importantly, not even more importantly, but in, in a larger sense, there were ministers who took for their text for, for days, for Sundays and Sundays afterwards, the, the immorality of the Dred Scott decision and speaking to it from the pulpit. One doesn't see that that often. And it politicized everything. And it certainly deeply politicized the election of November of 1860. So I want to just stop here for a second because we have a watershed moment. We have a transfer. And I'd like to move to the turn of the century. The, the, courts, the courts after the Civil War were pretty much nondescript, simply supporting big business and supporting big business and making sure that the unions never got started because you see they're Marxist and they're communist and so forth and, and we can't have that kind of activity. It's, it's not the American way. It offends the spirit of rugged individualism, social Darwinism, Horatio Alger. So the courts were pretty much in the pockets of the, of the railroad companies, the mining companies, steel and coal and oil and it's a dreary story and there's hardly a justice worth mentioning until until we get to Woodrow Wilson. I'm coming right to you. You know, Woodrow Wilson and his daring appointment, his 
his bold appointment of Justice Brandeis, you know, Louis Brandeis to the court, you know, the first man of the Jewish faith to the court, and probably, not probably, but certainly one of the top 10 jurists ever to serve on the court. And he wanted no part of the job. And what, what, what allows one to, to be able to become ranked in that way, it, deal, it deals with longevity, but longevity is not enough. It's the quality of the decision. It's the quality of the mind at work. It's the quality of someone being able to change his or her opinion in light of new facts, more pressing facts, important facts. Brandeis was asked, I'm getting right to you. Brandeis was asked, do you, do you ever plan to write your memoirs? And he said, I have. And they're in my decisions, over a thousand. That's where you will find the life of me in my decisions. Now, I think that's an excellent and a superlative comment. That's my gift to you, my decisions. And he was a brilliant writer. And not only was he a brilliant writer, he reminds me of Sandra Day O'Connor in this regard, or Sandra Day O'Connor reminds me of Brandeis in this regard, that Brandeis, as a Supreme Court justice, I want to be a teacher. I want to be able to write opinions that are that people can understand that they're not full of jargon and legalese. What is the point if I cannot teach as being on the Supreme Court? That he told Wilson, I do not want the appointment. I want to remain a teacher in the classroom. And Wilson said the Supreme Court, Louis, they're on first name terms, terms is <laughs> the most wonderful classroom in the world that you can teach from the court. Now, we don't hear that today, do we? No. I mean, the, you know, usually it's, I mean, and, and, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg writes the most convoluted and difficult decisions to decipher that one can imagine. But Brandeis, make it clear so people know what their court is thinking and what I'm thinking and how I view the law. And Brandeis always, that the law must be a living law. I don't care, well I do in intellectual fashion, you know, what perhaps the court was thinking in, in 1810, or let's say in, in, in 1825. That's of, of interest. But it is today, this is the present. What is the court doing today? What am I doing today in 1925 or 1920? That's Brandeis, a living law that the Constitution must grow and evolve as the nation changes. And anything you can get your hands on on Brandeis is remarkable. It just is great reading, and he was so self-effacing. Brandeis died, Brandeis died right before the United States got involved in World War II. And at least from my point of view, he was so self-effacing and, and not wishing to draw attention to himself I'm not quite certain he would be pleased that Brandeis University was named after him. Uh, he, he didn't, he did, I don't need that. In fact, he, what he did is he helped to fund the, the creation of the, of the law school at the University, uh, the University of Louisville Law School. And he provided seed money. He recommended courses, recommended professors, recommended books. And he said, I, he said no, no, please do not name it after me. But here's what I will leave you. And it's there on the grounds of the, of, of, the, of the law school. I will leave you my ashes, not my name. I don't need my name on a building. What I need is my memory. Read my, read my decisions. That's my life. You don't hear that too often, do you? He was a local guy out of Boston. Actually, he was from Kentucky, but made his first nut in Boston, did he? Local guy, living on the back of Beacon Hill. Please, the I question, know we want to back it up a little bit. The, the question I have is, the pre-Civil War court was basically Southerners, most of whom, most yeah. of whom were secessionists. How did the turnover in personnel go after the Civil War started? Well, Tawney, Tawney did not support secession. Uh, Tawney was a Marylander, and remember that Maryland did not leave the Union. Tawney did not support secession. However, he, however, what he did do is that he, he supported the right of the state of Maryland to make that decision if they wanted to. He did not support it. And he also did this. 
that he was all over Lincoln when, and Le Tawney, Tawney expected to be arrested at any moment because he was all over Lincoln for violating the, the writ of habeas corpus. I mean, during the Civil War, Lincoln, Lincoln very reluctantly, and then in, in a more bold move, began to close the newspapers and suspended the writ of habeas corpus, first only in Maryland, and then he expanded it across the North, that we are going to hold people without charging them because of the threat of, of armed insurrection, rebellion. And Lincoln looking at the language of the Constitution, and as an attorney, and Lincoln was a clever attorney. He knew that he was treading on dangerous ground when he suspended the writ of habeas corpus. I'm surprised it wasn't suspended temporarily after 9-11. But you know what Lincoln said about that? He said, I know what I'm doing is dangerous. And I admit to that. And I'm, and I'm speaking to the Congress. But then he said this. It was interesting. Trust me. Trust me. When this crisis is over, I will rescind that. Trust me. I'm doing this for the good of the country to save the country. Trust me. Only for the duration of the insurrection, the rebellion. He never used the word, phrase, civil war. Never. Insurrection, rebellion. And I'm using my authority as commander-in-chief to protect the nation. And you can trust me. When the crisis is passed, I'll rescind the executive order, which, which have rescinded the right of habeas corpus. Imagine, imagine someone trying to do that today. I mean, there would be absolute bedlam, and it would not happen. But that's Lincoln. Yeah, Tawney. Tawney, Tawney. Tawney died in 1864. And Tawney, he was all over Lincoln for the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, closing the press and so forth, and that he fully expected to be arrested and held for the duration of the war. That he was a, and, and, and here's a phrase, we, he was a Democrat, Tawney, and for many Democrats who did, who did not support Lincoln, those who did were called war Democrats, those who did not were called copperheads, snakes, if you will, <laughs> fire behind the lines. And Tawney expected to be arrested as a copperhead. Imagine, imagine marshals going in to arrest the, it's like Nazi Germany. I mean, going in to arrest the Supreme Court and simply holding them incommun incommunicado and denying the writ of habeas corpus. We're on, we're on the road to tyranny and dictatorship when that happens. But what about the other justices on the court? There were Southerners whose states had seceded. Did they stay on the court? Did they resign? Did they I, have no, I, have, I have no memory of any justice of the court who left the court when a state seceded. I'd have to check that out. But I don't have any memory of that. So they just stayed there through the Civil well, War? Well, th there wasn't a whole lot going on. I mean, you have to remember, you know, courts come and go, don't they, in terms of their authority. But I have no memory of, of a, let's say, a justice appointed from the state of Mississippi who resigned. For example, you know, like, you know, Lee resigned the United States Army and just because he could not draw a sword against Virginia. Um, yes, I see. Well, uh, I have a list of these. Supreme Court justices, there were uh, four or five appointees from 1862 to 1864, including John P. Chase as uh, uh, chief. Yeah, Lincoln appointed Chase. Chase. But these others, he must have appointed these too. Swain, well, it depends on the year, sure. Swain, Miller, these were all, this is 1862. And we don't even know those names, do we? No. It was a no-name court. Uh, <laughs> Miller, Davis, Fields, and Chase, all were. Where's Highlander? <laughs> you see that? It's a no-name court. I didn't even get there. <laughs> Speaking of Chase, the reason uh, to politicize all political, all political nominations to the court are they're, they're political. I mean, you can't say they're not political because the president chooses the person, and that's a political decision. It's a political nomination. Lincoln appointed Chase because Chase wanted his job as Secretary of the Treasury. Chase believed that he ought to be president in 1864, that Lincoln was a bundling fool, the war was being lost, and the Republican Party ought to nominate me rather than him. Now, Lincoln got wind of that. And rather than confronting Chase, it's like a, it, this is like a chess game. You're always, it's always best when you can take somebody down indirectly, if you can. And to get him out of the way, bringing in the Secretary of the Treasury, sir, 
I am proud to nominate you to the Supreme Court. <laughs> May I place your name in nomination? <laughs> no. All right. And everybody knew that was, the, that was the case. So every nominee is political. And of course, you know, I mean, the, the, the court became, the court was in the pocket of big business and certainly was, was uh, more interested in destroying big labor you know, after, you know, after the Civil War. It's social Darwinistic America. But that Civil War truly tested the elasticity, if you will, of the, of the Constitution and, and whether or not Lincoln could get away with it. That's why Lincoln is so interesting, isn't he? You put Lincoln in the name of anything and it'll show up. <laughs> People will come to listen about Lincoln. And he thought he was an utter failure. And, and it wasn't until after he died that history was being made for him, and he didn't have to do anything after that. I mean, he simply shot to the, to the top of the path. There was one more thing about, oh, Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln, again, the going after the Taney decision. The, the Emancipation Proclamation was not an act of Congress. The Emancipation Proclamation was an executive order signed by Lincoln, you know, freeing four million black folk and, and, and simply doing away with billions of dollars in property just with a signature. And he knew that if he were beat in 1864, and he expected to be beat, not only did I expect to lose, maybe not to be nominated, but if I am not renominated, he expected to get beaten in 1864 by a general whom he had fired, George McClellan, a Democrat, a, 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 a from New Jersey, and that McClellan would come in and simply sign a new executive order, you know, which would rescind the Emancipation Proclamation, and that we would have reunification based on these 11 states rejoining the Union with slavery. Um, that's what McClellan was all about. And, and that's why, even after Lincoln won in 1864, he wanted to make sure, and he did not live to see this, he wanted to make sure that the Emancipation Proclamation found its way into the Constitution as an amendment, because there it was safer as an amendment. We've only overturned one amendment, prohibition. It was safer as an amendment than it was simply as an executive order. So you see how the politics you know, get, get involved as well. And executive orders are tricky business. They, they really, I mean, they're tricky business. And I'm not, and, and it's, it's, it's really, it's very tenuous as to what can stand as an executive order and where you require the approval of Congress. And I'm not even going to go there because that shifts like the tide coming in and out. But there's Lincoln with his Constitution. And Lincoln also, since we're there, and how can you not talk about Lincoln for a moment? And, and I have to, I'm from Illinois, you know that. Uh, and, the, and, for, and for Lincoln, Lincoln to admit Lincoln to admit that the Constitution does not prohibit secession. And he admitted to that. He said, you're absolutely right. To those who were from South Carolina or Texas, whatever, that the Constitution does not prohibit or deny secession. You're absolutely right. But then he offered a but. There's always a but, isn't there? Huh? Yeah, but. <laughs> a great phrase, isn't it? He said, but, but, the reason the Constitution is silent about secession is that our founding fathers never expected any state to leave. And that's why, and again, he's begging the question here, this is why he would then argue there is language to grow the nation and add a state program, you see, states gathering populations, petitioning for statehood. They fully expected the nation to expand state by state and there's language to, to, to deal with that. And there's no language to deal with the state leaving the Union. They never imagined that the Union would contract. So while you are technically right, historically, you are wrong in my view of what the framers were thinking about. And how would you know? Well, because I do, I'm Abraham Lincoln, and I just told you. So a good attorney can argue both sides of the law. You know that. So it's, it's just fascinating, you know, as we, as we get to, the, to 1865 and Reconstruction, and 
the three critical amendments of the Civil War. Amendments 13, 14, and 15. 13, prohibiting slavery to make the Emancipation Proclamation an amendment. The 14, the 14, granting citizenship to black Americans, citizenship, national and federal, to black Americans and to Indians, and also that felicitous language, equal protection of the law and due process. And we said earlier, the 14th Amendment is the most frequently cited amendment whenever, whenever a case winds up before any court. And the 15th Amendment giving black men, not white women or black women, the right to vote. And, and, Lincoln, and Lincoln was in support of that. And Lincoln had told the ladies who were, had been agitating for the vote since 1848 and before that, that I will support suffrage for women in the future. Right now, I want your support for black men getting the right to vote because I need to maintain the growth of the Republican Party in the South after the war. So there's a political piece there. <laughs> but you're next up. And that's it in 1865. It's not until the end of World War I you know, that that finally comes to pass. So, so, there, I mean, so there's Lincoln, very much a politician, very careful, very clever, very smooth, and Lincoln never confronting if he could get around you and maneuver, and using humor to diffuse the situation. He'd leave you laughing, and he'd walk out of the room and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, what just happened here? Or what didn't happen here? He didn't answer the question again. Ask Mary. <laughs> Before we leave this, and we go to the progressive movement at the turn of the century, Woodrow Wilson, Louis Brandeis, anything? Um, Oliver Wendell Holmes. If you sent down to central casting, and you said, send me someone to play a member of the Supreme Court, that they would have sent you Oliver Wendell Holmes. If you go to the Harvard Law Library, his painting is so, it's enormous, it's absolutely, it's so impressive, that shock of white hair and that, and that long, wavy mustache that he began growing during the Civil War so he didn't look like he was 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and he never, you know, he never trimmed that away. He, and, but Oliver Wendell Holmes and Louis Brandeis became fast friends. And they were so different. I mean, he was a patrician. He was from Helms from Beacon Hill. And Brandeis' old man was a grain merchant you know, in, uh, in Kentucky. And, and I, it's hard to imagine a guy with the last name of Brandeis with a Kentucky accent. <laughs> my guy, it yes, sounds like he's from Yonkers or Brooklyn or something. But he, you know, he made his way. He made his way to to Harvard and did quite well. Thank you very much. And and graduated first in his class and 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 with the who who was that? It was the uh, wasn't was the Warrens, one of the descendants of Joseph. Uh, jo Joseph Warren, who died at Bunker Hill, and uh, they, they opened up a two-man law office. And Warren said, I'll get, I'll get all the Protestants, and Louis, you get the Jews. All right? <laughs> and we're going to be, and we're off and running, and we're going to make a fortune. And they did. And for Louis Brandeis, it was not about making money. I mean, he made money because he was good. And he always would tell his clients, I want to know more about your business than you know. Who was going to get the Catholics? I don't know. I don't know. Mayor White. <laughs> Waiting in the wings. The, and, and Brandeis was never about making money. Brandeis was about doing the right thing. And what he hoped to do at some point is that, that, he, would be, that he would be able to simply work pro bono you know, for the rest of his life, defending people who simply could not afford the type of defense I can provide you, that I want to know more about your business than you know about it. And this firm, Warren and Brandeis, we are not ambulance chasers. We choose the cases. We're not here simply to, in fact, he would say, if we go into court, I have failed you. I have failed you. The best, the best deal I can offer you is keep you out of court, avoid all this litigation, I'll save you money, I will fail you if this goes to court. It's about addressing it around the table. That's Brandeis. And it's interesting, most, so many people want to go to court, don't they, and rack up those hourly fees. I have failed you. This is about compromise. 
This is about litigation across the table and about simply being honorable and respectful and keeping your word, ma'am. You know, it's not you, but keeping your word, you know, once we have agreed and signed off on this. And, and Brandeis, Brandeis was a, became a progressive. And at the turn of the century, we cannot talk enough about the progressives. They were reformers. And these were middle class reformers. These were attorneys and editors and teachers and, and, and professors and, and so forth, clergymen, who, who did not want to throw the Industrial Revolution overboard. Absolutely not. I mean, they, 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 they embraced the Industrial Revolution and all that it had brought. The, you know, the shriek of the factory whistle, the, the bang, bang, bang of the rivet gum, the, the rustle of greenbacks and all of that. But there's a downside to the Industrial Revolution, and that was that it's built on child labor, the 14-hour day, 10 cents an hour, absolutely no safety standards. There's no profit in safety, as Carnegie would tell you, or whomever, Armour and Swift would tell you. What we need to do as a progressive is we need to improve the quality of life for every American. And I can use the, we can use the courts to do that. The Bible of the progressives, I'm just watching our time here. The Bible of the progressives was, it's still in print, all right? It's called the promise, the promise of America. And as Brandeis would say, the promise of America is for everyone to prosper and to be safe and secure, and that all of us celebrate being we, the people. That's Brandeis. And when Brandeis became a counselor to Woodrow Wilson and a supporter of Wilson's policies to bring reform to the Industrial Revolution and get women, get, get children in school and women out of the laundry, and there's a reason for that, and we'll hold that for October, all right? So something to think about, that and flour. All right. Think about flour, making bread, and think about doing doing the laundry. There's are two huge cases coming. But but Brandeis, Wilson wanted Wilson wanted to appoint Brandeis as his attorney general to really go after these guys. And Brandeis said, absolutely not. If you do that, you're gonna lose every vote in the country. Some of you. I mean, I, come on, it's anti-Semitism out there. And they all know I'm hostile. And I'm not hostile because I want to break them up. It's you're doing bad things to people. And I want to do something to regulate that. And please, do not ask me to serve on the court. And that's when Wilson said, but Brandeis, Louis, call him Louis. It's the greatest classroom in the world. In 1916, Wilson will nominate Brandeis to the court. And Senator both senators from Massachusetts will vote against him, that he's a radical, he's a liberal, he's a Bolshevik, he's a red, he's dangerous. That's Senator Lodge and Senator John Weeks. The man was none of those things. He was a tribune of the people that, as, I, as Sandra Day O'Connor, how does this law affect people? I want to write my decision so you will understand the thinking of the court. You know, we are the final judge here. And that's, and that's Brandeis. When Brandeis was on the court, Wilson, Wilson knew that Brandeis was so, he was so clean. He was above reproach. And he would call up Brandeis to ask him for his opinion. And Brandeis would say, but I'm sitting on the Supreme Court, Mr. President. We cannot have this conversation over the phone. By the way, Franklin Roosevelt, will nickname Brandeis Isaiah. And as he got older, his hair all growing out, like he was living in an electromagnetic field. You know, you know, he looked like an Old Testament prophet. And Franklin Roosevelt would say, but you know, when a case was making its way to the court, how's Isaiah going to respond to this? You see, and you all know, sometimes one person can carry a room, can't they? One person can carry a committee. What's Isaiah going to say about this? What Wilson would do, because I need the counsel of Brandeis. He trusted his judgment. He was one of those men who could cut right to the heart of it, say, this is right, this is wrong, this is how we fix it. And what Wilson would do is he would get in the presidential limousine. Actually, it was not a presidential limousine. It was a private car slipping out from the White House garage, go to the Brandeis residence, ring the doorbell, get out of the, ring the doorbell. Mrs. Brand Alice would come 
would come to the door and he'd say, is, is the justice available or am I disturbing you? <laughs> I said, well, we're about to have dinner, right? But I'm sure he could find 15 or 20 minutes for you. And Wilson would slip in as best as a president can slip in anywhere unobserved to sit down with Isaiah and say, what do you think? He said, you can't ask me that, but I came here. There's nobody, nobody saw me. I came in through the back door. I came in through the cellar door. What do you think? That doesn't happen today. It ought not happen anyway. But this is Brandeis. Said, I am not going to misuse my position here. And Wilson, I need you on the court. And I need the benefit of your wisdom. When Brandeis thought he was beginning to fail, he went to uh, Justice Hughes. And he offered his resignation. And you said, not yet, but I will tell you when. You say, I think I'm beginning to lose my fastball. I've lost, uh, and not yet. And it won't be until several years later that Brandeis will retire, and he will pass away shortly after that. He, he reminds me again of, of John Adams. And when I begin dying at the top, I think I mentioned this. Abigail, when I begin dying at the top, pull me in. You know, I, I don't want to be a burden. Hughes, it's a time, not yet, Louis, but I'll tell you when it's time. When you tell me it's time, it's time. I don't want to lose my fastball. It's, it's, it's good to go out on the top of your game, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's Willie Mays. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's my guy. Yes. He was never uh, Chief Justice. Never Chief Justice. But uh, he, uh, uh, apparently he wrote most of the opinions. Yes, he did. He wrote, he wrote over a thousand opinions. That's why I said my memoirs are in my opinions. Absolutely. And, and in many, many cases, Holmes would join him. And Holmes was so opposite. Holmes, when, when Brandeis was confirmed, and terrible, and back, back then, the justices did not appear to be quizzed by the Senate Judiciary Committee. The way it was done, you never showed up. The way it was done, letters of recommendation would be written for you, or people would come to, to offer testimony for you. And and, uh, and, and, and it was really nasty. With, uh, uh, Taft, former President Taft, now back at, the, at Yale Law School, was able to get four or five former presidents of the American Bar Association to join him in a letter condemning Brandeis as a dangerous radical, mm -hmm. a man who ought not be on the court. He's a red. And that's why Brandeis said to Wilson, you don't need this Greek. Withdraw my name. You don't need me. So I need you on the court. You're a teacher. And you can use those court sessions to teach as well. And Brandeis was not a table thumper. It was simply being reasonable to look at the law this way rather than that way. A living law. It might be interesting what they did back in Rome, but it's 1935, it's 1925. It isn't, can we scalp tickets at the Coliseum? You know, is that a felony? It's what do we need to do today? And that's why, and that's why he kept a careful eye on the New Deal as well. Brandeis was not in favor of bigness. He would not support Walmart or Home Depot. He liked the mom and pop stuff. Keep it small, keep it Jeffersonian, keep it yeoman, keep it personal, know your neighbor. He had a place down in Chapel. And and when he went and when, when he would he would spend the month of August down in Chatham, and he would play tennis and do some rowing and so forth. I don't think he ever fished. I can't see Brandeis. I've never seen a photograph of him fishing. I can't put those two words in the same sentence. And, but Brandeis would say, I can do 12 months of work in 11 months, but I need a month off just for a little decompression. We'll talk more about Brandeis and the two or three key cases looking out for the, ter the, the people, particularly, well, I know it's getting late, particularly it's going to be Mueller versus Oregon. And I'll save that. That's my book. Yes? Uh, we all know how people become members of the Supreme Court. How do they I'm trying to find out. Do you know how many times I've offered my resume? <laughs> yes, and I understand why it's being offered. However, how, how, why I've been denied. I understand it too. However, I'd like to know how they decide who will be the Chief Justice. I always thought that was the justice in no, the cheapest point. No, but no, this Chris Roberts just kept James dropping out of the sky. The typically what happens, and again, typically, oftentimes when there's an opening, 
and particularly if the Chief Justice has passed away, it's clear that that person will be the Chief Justice. Typically, the President will choose the Chief Justice. And I think what I'm thinking of is when, when Warren went to the court, the Chief Justice had just passed away, uh, Justice Vincent. And Warren had a promising place on the court. But Eisenhower said, but, but the opening is for Chief Justice. And I want to appoint a Chief Justice. Well, I'm the guy, the first opening. So Eisenhower said, well, I gave you my word, and I will. So that's how he became Chief Justice. He never would have been Chief Justice if, if, um, if Vincent had not died. And he never would have been able to do the work of Earl Warren as Chief Justice, because he would have been he would have been corralled by Vincent. Vincent had sent back Brown v. Board or cases like it for years. Mm -hmm. Plessy versus Ferguson had been on the books since 1896, and the Supreme Court does not like to overturn precedent. Warren, I want to overturn this precedent of Plessy versus Ferguson. The Civil War overturned, uh, overturned Dred Scott versus Sanford. I'm out of words. <laughs> I've got to go give somebody a final.